Okay. All right, all right. So welcome back, everybody. I'm glad to see all your shiny faces. Does anyone have any uh, uh, fun plans for the weekend? I think we finally have seen the end of the outrageously warm weather in Sacramento, so I'm, I'm very happy to see that it's starting to cool off. Um, usually about this time of year, I kind of get fed up with all the warm weather, and I'm really looking forward to wearing, you know, long sleeve shirts and busting out my hoodies and my sweatshirts and stuff, you know. I miss that part of my wardrobe, so I'm, I'm looking forward to that over the upcoming weeks. Although this, there's always a weird kind of adjustment period in Sacramento, like, you know, and it's always this time of year, where it's still like in the mid-80s, but then it's like god-awful cold in the morning, right? So you have to like bundle up with your, like, your winter parkas and your gloves and your hats and stuff, because it's like 50 degrees out, you know, 6 or 7 o'clock in the morning when I go to work. And then it's like 80 degrees in the afternoon, right? So it's, gonna, it's kind of a weird contrast. Uh, all right. Uh, so this week, uh, well, before we go any further, I should start off by asking, how went your, uh, your spaceship attack? Did the invading spaceship army get eliminated by your tower defense system? Was everyone successful? Did they shoot down some spacecraft? All right, all right. Okay, yeah. So if you have questions, don't freak out. If you have questions, we'll get you up and running as fast as we can. This is a challenging project. You know, I wanted this one to be kind of a... Uh, a real challenge and a real test for you guys going forward, okay? Constraints are a really powerful addition to the Moto rigging system. And it's one that I think often is overlooked, okay? So, which is why I wanted to kind of jump up and down and really give you guys an opportunity to flex your muscles and show us uh, what you can do with these really powerful, uh, you know, these powerful operators. Yeah, comment, question. You know, I, can, I, haven't, I haven't actually downloaded any of the, uh, the assignments. Since they were due, you know, 15 minutes ago. <laughs> I haven't had a chance uh, to look at them. Come on in, Greg. But maybe during a break, I can download them real fast so we can check them out. That'd be kind of fun. At the very least, we'll absolutely watch them next week. So, absolutely. I always like to watch the, uh, the animations in class because it's, 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 it's motivating seeing the other work that the folks have been doing in this class. And I can already see Seth is like going Tron-esque over here. That's awesome, man. I can't wait to see that all finished and rendered if it's not already. It's done. Sweet. Sweet. Can't wait to see it. Um, we'll take a look at them during the break. Okay? Oh, don't say that. Don't say that. I'm sure it's fantastic. Um, okay. This week, we're going to completely change gears. <laughs> well, not completely change gears, but we're going to extend our knowledge and our kind of fluency of the rigging tools by really jumping in to the art of character rigging. Over the last three weeks, we've been looking at kind of hard surface rigging. You know, we've, under, we've got a really nice understanding of the role of items, uh, the hierarchies, and constraints. Now, we're going to take what we learned about rigging and really start to apply it to some characters. Okay? There's a reason we don't initially jump into characters, because if we started you know, rigging characters without any of that, uh, of that other knowledge, you would be lost. You'd be totally confused, and you wouldn't really understand exactly what we're trying to accomplish here. Okay? So it's a good practice and a good foundation, all this stuff that we've been learning over the last two or three weeks. Kaylee. Uh, I was about to say, like, like you would probably get lost after you like, completely modeled the character. Yeah, absolutely. And I don't, I don't want you guys to be lost. There's kind of a foundation of skills that we're trying to establish here. And you'll find that as we go throughout the, uh, the rest of the semester, and you know, this week's content is a really, really, really great illustration of that is that we're going to scaffold. You know, we're going to talk about an idea and then we're going to, you know, we're going to expand upon that idea and then we're going to expand upon that idea even more. So the ideas are going to build on top of each other. This week's content, we're going to start working with uh, our character rigging tool set by exploring how to infuse an internal skeletal system on a very simple model. In addition, we're also going to be talking about how to take that skeleton and bind it, you know, kind of glue it to the actual mesh itself, okay? At the conclusion of this process, you'll have a character that moves, okay? Today's homework and illustration, they're going to be very, very basic and very, um, I don't want to say easy, but it's a basic, basic rig. Next week, we're going to take a look at what we've done, and we're going to build on it. And we're going to basically start all over again, okay? But this time, we're going to add a certain level of uh, complexity into the new rig. So this is like character rigging 101. Next week is going to be character rigging, like, 201, and the week after that's going to be character rigging 301. And each week we're going to, get, we're going to be getting more and more complex uh, with the tool sets, the techniques, and the um, just the basic features of the rig itself. Okay.
You guys ready? Ready to jump into it? Okay. So for our homework this week, we're going to be modeling a skeleton and binding it. Okay. I'll show you this in here in a minute. This is the only thing that we're going to be doing this week. Okay. Um, we have quite quite a, and, and I always like to, I hit you hard with the project, right, because this spaceship thing was a big project, and I knew you guys have been living in the lab over the last couple of weeks, or last week, excuse me. So, I, you know, whenever I have a big project, I tend to kind of pull back a little bit, let you guys exhale and breathe and kind of get, you know, <laughs> you know revisit your social life, to say, say hi to your significant other, you know, <laughs> things like that. So this is not going to be a backbreaker like the previous assignment was, okay? Next week, however, is going to be a backbreaker. We're really going to start to get some really cool advanced rigs going. Okay? Um, it's my way of saying thank you for, for all the hard work that you've been putting in on your, on your spaceship attack, your alien invasion. Okay. So today is all about joints in the internal skeletal system that we need to have really kind of mastery on in order for the process of character rigging to be complete. That's going to be the homework, okay? And, and in the resources section, I have two things. Oh, I've got to refresh my page, excuse me. I have two things in the resources tab that I want you guys to look at, of course. You have the model file itself, so you just download that real fast. In addition, I've also given you a really cool JPEG that I made this morning that kind of illustrates uh, the location of all the joints that we're going to create for this week. Next week, we're going to expand upon this significantly. This is just kind of, you know, character rigging 101, okay? These are the basic, basic joints that we're going to be infusing in our character. And actually, you're going to add a couple more on top of these, but this is the basic structure that we're going to follow, okay? Specifically from this angle, you can't really see the details of the hands, the joints and the hand, um, and we really can't see the joint location for the feet, okay? So we're going to be looking at that in detail uh, a little bit later on, how to do those two components specifically. At the end of this week's project, you'll be able to take this model, infuse this internal skeletal system, including all the joints for the hands and for the feet, bind it to the character, and make it move. Okay? So that's going to be the, the, the product of this week's uh, homework assignment. All right. This is a good, I think, visual representation of where we're striving to place all these joints with inside of our internal skeletal system. And as you can see, there are a bunch. Okay? There's a reason we have these many joints and in these locations. More on that in a minute. So this isn't just like Pat going crazy and just clicking away and adding random joints in random locations. Okay? There is a method to the madness that we'll go over here momentarily. So on top of our, our cool little blueprint, make sure you download um, the model file too. Okay? I didn't model this file, so I can't take credit for it. But it is a good little model file. Here it is on my desktop. If we take a look at it, let's just throw it into 701 and begin. Okay, so cool little green dude. That's what we're going to be working on this week for our homework, okay? Now, up until now, all of our characters and all of our models have been hollow. If we wanted to move this item, we're limited, very much so, um, in the capacity that we can move this object around the scene. For example, if we go in right now and just jump into item mode, jump into item mode and I fire off the item transform tool, the capacity that we have to move this object is, ex exists purely at the center point for this object. So that's about as all we can do at item level. And certainly what we don't want to do is go in and do something like this. And from time to time, I see people making this mistake. How, let's, uh, let's pretend that, excuse me, let's pretend that for whatever reason, in your infinite wisdom, you feel as though you should be doing this in component mode. Okay. This is what we don't want to do. We don't want to go in and like select all these fingers and then try to rotate them, you know, like this. I see every once in a while I see people doing this and it's like, what? Are you serious? Come on now. Let's just do automatic. Okay, and they're like, we're just I want to close the hand like this. Okay. Yeah, no, bad. Uh-uh. That's what we don't want to do, right? Thus into the role of joints, because we get to infuse a control system that will do this type of deformation for us, okay? Now, when we're rigging characters, we're going to be taking a mesh that's not too dissimilar from this. And if you were to start to look very closely at this mesh, you're going to find this all one piece, okay? Uh, however, we can do this exact same process with multi, mul multiple uh, meshes with multiple pieces on them, okay? However, this entire system is made a whole lot easier if the entire character is, exists in one mesh item. 
Okay, so it can be discontiguous. I think that's encouraged. I really, uh, that's a great idea. A lot of the character meshes that I've worked on in the past are discontiguous pieces, but we need to get them down into a single mesh item at the end of the day. Because when we start binding all of these skeletal joints to the mesh, that's going to be an item to item kind of a, a connection and a relationship that's made. All right? Let me hit undo real fast and kind of remove that. Okay. Throughout the course of the day, we're going to spend all, you're going to hear me spending a lot of time talking about the role of deformation. And when we get into character rigging, that's really what we're doing. So help me out. What in, what in the world is deformation? Deforming. Is, so what are, we, what are we deforming? What is, what is deformation? Polygons. What are we doing to the polygons? Making the arms move. Making the arms move. We're bending them, right? We're bending them. We're physically changing the topology. Okay. The process of deformation inside of Moto is, is uh, easy, but it's also incredibly powerful. I think you've heard me talk uh, in GCOM 402 about the awesomeness of the Moto rigging system. I think this skeletal system that we're going to be exploring here in a second is a perfect example of the power of the Moto rigging system, but it doesn't end there. Um, as many of you guys uh, know, there's a fantastic, fantastic, uh, um, I hesitate to even call it a tutorial. Um, uh, but it's a, it's, a, it's a book that's written by my favorite character rigger, Hippiedrome. And Hippiedrome, yeah, I love me some Hippiedrome. Uh, Hippiedrome and the Art of Art Articulation is an amazing learning resource to, uh, it, that really digs in to how powerful the motor rigging system can be. It's pretty, it's pretty amazing. Um, the guys down at Pixar have had a heavy, 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 heavy amount of influence on the creation of all of these deformation and rigging tools. A number of the lead riggers down at, down at Pixar um, are part of the Luxology development team and, ha and have had uh, an active part in developing the tool set that we have in front of us. So I think that, for me personally, I've done a lot of rigging in both Maya and Cinema 4D. This is the easiest set of tools uh, that I've ever experienced that allows us to quickly jump in and get some good results without too much effort. Okay? So, let's jump in and begin. So, let's jump over into the Setup tab. As always, everything that we're going to be doing inside this process is going to be done and in the Setup tab. Okay? Setup tab, Setup tab, Setup tab. Get out of the mindset of doing everything in the modeling, one, in modeling uh, tab. I know that's often a hard transition for traditional 3D modelers to make, uh, myself included. I spend a tremendous amount of tab in the modeling environment. So every once in a while, I have to remind myself, oh, I need to jump over to the setup tab, especially for the character rigging stuff, because this is really the only place inside the entire interface that we're going to find the character rigging tools. Now, initially, we're looking for some skeleton joints. All right, so we're looking for some skeleton joints. So if you look over at your, at your setup toolbar over here, you're going to see at the very top of the toolbar, we have the option to go in and apply some skeletons. Okay, And really, it's called the skeleton tool. Um, however, it really should be called the joint tool because that's really what we're creating here. We're crafting a whole network of interconnected joints that will allow our body to be bent and deformed around some very specific areas on the mesh. So let's go ahead and activate the skeleton tool. Okay, the skeleton tool is pretty powerful. And oh, let me take a step back. There are so many rigging tools inside of the setup window that the guys down at Luxology have had to kind of separate out the tools from their options. And trust me, this is going to take a little getting used to. Okay, it's definitely taken me getting used to because when you're in the modeling tab, you know you fire off the tool, and then right below you have all the tool options, right? Well, because of the number of rigging tools that are in this environment, notice that there's another tab next to commands. Those are the tool properties or the tool options. So whenever we activate any tool inside the setup toolbar, all the options are going to be found in that tab. Okay? Kind of confusing initially, and it's, I, it's definitely something that you're going to miss the first two or three times. But just remember, the Tool Properties tab is where you're going to find all the tool options for all of the setup, tool, setup tools. Okay. All right. So inside your Tool Properties, there's a couple things in here that I just want to look at initially. Yep. Okay. Okay. We're going to talk about some of these in detail here in a minute, but for the moment, I want to turn off my symmetry. I'm just going to turn it off. You'll see it in action here in a minute, okay? 
but initially, we want to create the internal skeletal structure for the base uh, of our character first, or excuse me, for the spine of our character first, and for the legs. So we'll come back to infusing those symmetrical elements here momentarily. Okay, let's zoom out a little bit and begin our work. Okay. Intersection, I would, I would encourage you to turn intersection on, but not, it's not really super, super important for, this, for the spine, for the arms and the legs. It will become uh, really important for the fingers, okay? Shoot, I'll just turn it off so you guys can see what I'm talking about. Let's just turn it off, huzzah. And I'm also going to turn my action center off as well, okay? Now, whenever we're, in, whenever we're infusing the skeletal structure for our characters, we have to create, initially, a critical component to our entire mesh. The first joint that we're going to lay down is called the root joint, okay? And the root joint plays a critical role, a, a crucial role inside the rigging process. The root joint, effectively, is going to become the parent of the entire hierarchy. Okay. Now, the, you're going to hear me say and talk a lot about hierarchies today, and hierarchy is a big word when developing the internal st uh, joint structure for our character, right? And, you know, this entire process can be taken back to kindergarten, you know, the head bones connected to the shoulder bones, shoulder bones connected, you know, that, you know, the thing, right? So we're doing the exact same thing here, okay? We're making a hierarchy of connected joints, okay? Everything, everything stems from the root joint, okay? It's the master object, and in many ways, it's going to be the global controller for our skeleton, okay? All joints stem from the root, okay? It's the only thing, it's the, it's the topmost element in our hierarchy, and it's the, pretty much the only thing that is not going to be animated, okay? Although from time to time, I do see people animating the root, which is not a problem. I just historically try not to do it, okay? All right, so the first thing that we're gonna lay down is the root joint. Please note that I've changed my perspective viewport into an orthographic viewport. I'm looking through my scene from the front. Um, we wanna work with a certain degree of accuracy in here, okay? So utilizing these orthographic viewports, I think is a really, really good idea. We have to be a little bit careful as to where we're placing these joints so that we get the correct deformation across the mesh that we want. All right, the skeleton tool is really easy to use, okay? Simply left clicking anywhere inside the interface is gonna create our first joint. And there it is, there's my first joint. It's ginormo at the moment. But that's it. That's the icon for the joint. Let's move it around a little bit here. You can, you can probably already get a sense that in the center of that joint, there's a little yellow dot. That control point allows us to interactively choose where that root is going to be. Okay. Now, for me, I always put the root joint kind of right down there. And in my mind, this is kind of like your tailbone. Okay. Everything stems from the tailbone. Okay. So that's, that's a good place for it to be, kind of out of the way. However, I would not recommend putting it up here around the hips because you're just going to confuse yourself. You're going to confuse yourself as to the role of this joint. There's not going to be any deformation down here in the tailbone section of our model, so it's a good place to store the root, get it out of the way, and ensure that we don't accidentally select it or rotate it when we're animating our character. Okay? So there's our first joint. Okay? Please notice that the tool is still live. We're going to create the entire skeletal structure for my character in one mighty blow here, okay? So in one kind of operation, we're gonna go in and lay down all the joints for our character. So I just turned on the skeleton tool, and then I clicked in the viewport to apply my first joint. Okay, now that we have our first joint, we need to start looking at a way for us to quickly go in and define the spine. Let's look at our reference photograph real fast. Oops, excuse me, I accidentally clicked. Let's look at our reference photograph real fast and get a good understanding and idea of what we're working with here, or what the goal for all of this is. Okay, so if we zoom in and look at this real fast. Oops, excuse me, there we go. What we're establishing here, and I forgot to turn on my highlighter app, excuse me. I am horrible with lists. There we go. OK, 
Okay, all right. So if you look very carefully down here at the bottom, there's the root joint that we've just created in our skeleton. Okay, and now we need to start establishing some really important joints within our, our spine. Okay, these three guys, or four guys, excuse me, are going to be the elements that we want to use to establish our spine. Now, if you look really carefully where I'm placing these joints within our spine, what I'm trying to establish here are areas of rotation. Joints inside of, inside of our character rigging tool are basically where our character is going to rotate around. We're almost creating a whole series of little center points along our character that's going to allow certain parts of our body to be rotate, rotated at those locations. The spine is an important area within our character. We want to be able to rotate our character along a number of different axes, excuse me, a number of different points along the spine so that we can get a really nice curve along the back of our character. If we only had two joints along the back of our character, the only sort of deformation that we would get is something like this, right? You know, so if when our guy bends over, it's always going to be a plank. You know, he's always going to have a perfectly straight back. We don't want that, okay? our internal structure that we create kind of need, needs to resemble how an actual character, you know, actual, you know, actual you know, skeletal system on a human being is, okay? The closer we can get to that result, the better, okay? The more accurate the deformation of the mesh is going to be. However, on, with, that note, with that said, don't go crazy, okay? <laughs> you know, there are a lot of different vertebrae in your spine. Does anyone really know how many vertebrae there are? 20-something? Yeah, 20 or 30-something, right? There's a whole bunch. Do not put 20 or 30 <laughs> joints along your spine, okay? That is madness. That is madness. I, I like four. I know some people out there in the industry that like three. So there are, you know, three and four, that's kind of right about where you want to hang out for the most part. You can add more, but I think you're going to see that once you start going on top of four, you're really not going to see a significant result, okay? And there's really no benefit or increase in the quality of the movement by adding more and more and more joints along the spine. This, this is a good starting point. Can we use that image? It's kind of like a map to help us where the joint location is. Absolutely, sure. If you want to do it, I say do it, man. Absolutely. Okay. For sure. Okay. So we have, let's see, one, two, three, four. Okay. If you look where I've placed all these joints, it's giving us the ability to rotate our character around some very specific regions, okay? Uh, down here, this guy is gonna allow us to rotate our character around the hips, okay? So if we want our guy to bend over and touch his toes, that's gonna be the locator, excuse me, that's gonna be the joint within the skeleton that will allow us to do that. Rock and roll, pretty great. In addition, sometimes a lot of character animators like myself like the ability to rotate our character from you know, kind of the ab section or at least have control over the rotation parameters over in here. Same with under the pectoral muscles. And then kind of the upper spine, the thoracic area of the back, that's a good one to add a little bit of detail on. Those four rotation points will give you a good start. Okay. All right. So let's go ahead and, and throw those down. Um, let's jump back over into Moto real fast. And take a look at what we got. So there's my root, okay? Now I need one kind of up here by the hips, so I'm just simply going to left click and then drag it into position. Look carefully where you're placing these joints, okay? I'm looking at the wireframe of my mesh, and it's really easy to see on this mesh that there's a very clear and defined center line. It's a good visual kind of uh, landmark when placing these joints for the spine. Kaylee, you got a question? Yours isn't working for some odd reason. Well, let's take a look, see, see, what, see what we can see. Ah, okay, so Kaylee's running into an interesting thing, and I even ran into this, and, I've, and I kind of glossed over it, so I do apologize. Let me hit undo. So here is the first joint, and you can see how big the icon is. It's a massive circle. Okay, if we were to look at it in 3D, that's kind of what it looks like. Two concentric, two concentric circles or three concentric circles, excuse me, okay? What Kaylee is doing, and I even did this, was she was clicking right here. And notice where my cursor is. It's right on the, one of the lines for my joint, and it looks as though this, nothing's happening and nothing isn't happening, okay? So what I do is I usually like click off of that line over here, and then I put it back where I want it to go, okay? If, you, if you're comfortable working with the pen tool or the pipe tool or any number of tools that, are gen, that generate a whole series of control vertices to establish 
uh, a plane, a mesh, whatever, you're getting the same kind of control system here inside of Moda. Okay? At the center of each one of our joints, you can see that we have a little bit, a little blue control, uh, control surface, right? That little dot, or it's a little cube, excuse me. Um, as long as they're blue, we can go in and edit the location of all of these uh, control vertices pretty quickly. The gold one represents the active control vertice, and any additional joint that we create will be created from that spot. All right. I just clicked. Just clicked. Left click. All right. So maybe right around there. I want to put another one kind of in the middle of the abs, somewhere right around there. So you're free to go in and continue editing the location of all these joints as you work. But just remember, whatever control or whatever joint has the gold square represents the active control point, and all joints will be made from the active one. All right, so there's the middle of my abdomen, bottom of my, of my, of my pecs, kind of the center of the thoracic area. Okay, and now we're doing some pretty good things. There's a good start for my spine. If we were to jump back over to our reference for a second, you'll find pretty quickly that, of course, we have all of these guys in here. We just, we just threw down those four, okay? However, since we're working up the spine, we should start looking at these guys, okay? These three joints are, are kind of important because they're going to allow us to create a very simple control mechanism for our head. And in my mind, what we're outlining here is the base of the neck for the bottom one, the top of the neck, right, and the middle, the middle dot there, and then that top red one is the top of the head. The top of the head is the end of the hierarchy. It's the end of our, of our chain, uh, and we absolutely need to have it, okay? So some people say, well, why do we do a base of the neck? Okay, why can't we just do top of the neck? Well, if you think about it, the top of the neck is kind of over here by your jawbone, kind of right underneath the base of your cranium. If you all reached around to the back of your heads, you'd feel the natural termination point for your cranium. There should be a big dot there, okay? A big kind of lump. Well, there's a mine, at least. Um, that's the base of your cranium. That's the base of the neck. That's where our head really rotates around when we're doing this type of movement. We're bobbing up and down. That's where our head is rotating around. Now, if you want to do kind of the duck bob, you know, kind of doing this, okay? Then you're going to have, if you want to do this, where you're lowering your head, you're going to be rotating your neck around the base of your neck. So we have two areas of rotation here that are required to get some realistic head movement. Base of the neck, top of the neck, and then the top of the head, we just need to have a joint up there as the terminator of the chain, okay? Let's go and just craft those real fast. All right, so let's just do it and zoom in on, on my green dude's head. So I'm just going to eyeball it from here. There's the base of the neck. Here's the top of the neck and then the top of the head. Okay. Now, with, with the tool still active, let's check out our model from the right and start making some edits. Okay. Let's start down here at the base and get a really good understanding of where we need to place all these joints along our model. Okay? The tool is still active. We can still see the light blue cube on the interior of all the joints. So that means we get to move them around. And we want to move them around. Okay? We want these joints to resemble the actual location, if you will, of their real world counterparts. Okay? And out here in the real world, our spine is not in the, the front portion of our body. right? Where is the spine? Your, where is your spine? Yeah, in your back. Yeah, absolutely. So our joints need to be over here. So with the tool still active, we can very quickly go in and continue to edit the location of all these joints to get the locations that we want. So I'm just going to pull them back. There we go. And this one I'll put kind of in the middle of the shoulder blades. There's the, uh, that's the, uh, um, that's base of neck, so I'm going to pull that up a little bit. I'll pull this one up. There's the base of the neck, this one right here. Here's the top of the neck and the top of the head. Yeah, Kaylee. What if you're on um, joint four? Mm -hmm. What if you want to show on different perspectives? Ah, okay. So you dropped the tool, didn't you? I don't think I have. It's still in the front. Oh, yeah, sure is. That's a... Uh, that's interesting. So do me a favor, go into the side view again. Yeah. 
interesting. Ah, okay, let's do this. Hit the, uh, the O key to bring open your viewport properties. Mm -hmm. And let's go into the visibility tab. Oh. Yeah, visibility. Da, da, da. Turn off show lights. Turn off show lights? Yeah, at the very top. Interesting. Show pivots. Show pivots. Uh, do all. See where it says show pivots kind of in the middle? Um, Oop, just, just blew by it. Yeah, do all. And then under center centers, show all. Interesting. Okay. Interesting. Click on this guy for me. Maybe because the item isn't selected. No, that's rather odd. I've never seen that before. Ah, you're in shaded. Let's go to advanced OpenGL. Okay. No, interesting. Hmm. No, go on to the left. Interesting. What happens if we change it to wireframe? Oh, that's a good one, Kaylee. I don't. I have never seen that. I've never seen the tools not. Oh, let's try this. Maybe someone had turned off the overlays. Go to drawing and control. Okay. Turn on overlay. And let's see. Holy moly. Oh, no. Okay, let's do this. Click out of here. Drop your tool for me. And I want you to go to the top where it says layout. Okay. And I want you to do restore. There we go. Awesome. Okay, you okay? Cool. Go back into the setup tab for me. Find, find your character. Ah, I know why. Okay. Oh, no. Um, it wasn't showing it because your spine was way, way off over there. Oh, I see. Yeah. Um, however, we can fix this. Hang tight just for a second. Okay. okay. Hang tight. We're going to get there. So the, the problem that Kaylee was running into was that she was able to see her spine from the front, her joints from the front. When she went into the side view, they were gone, right? And you probably heard me just going, Whoa, I don't even know what to do here right now. It's kind of confusing. Well, let me kind of uh, show you what had happened to Kaylee's joints, okay? What we're create, uh, creating here are true three-dimensional items, okay? They exist in 3D, and like all 3D, 3D items in Modo, they have a defined position within our scene, okay? Her spine was way over here in the background along the negative z-axis. Somehow it got crafted over there. That's okay. We can always go back and fix it. We can always go back and fix it, okay? Um, I'm going to drop the tool because I want to show you one of the cool things about working with the moto, uh, the moto rigging tools, okay? In moto, what we've crafted here are special types of items, okay? Moto understands that what we've created here are more than just regular locators. If we were to examine the contents of our item list, you'll start to see the hierarchy of locators that we've created and the icons that we're gaining over in the item list kind of almost uh, you know, subconsciously reminds you that what we've created here are just a whole bunch of locators, but they're more than that. They're special locators, okay? These locators, or Moda understands that these locators are joints, okay? Check this action out. If we were to turn the tool back on, have your skeleton, the root of your skeleton selected, if we were to turn the tool back on, check it out. Moda is going to understand that these are joints still, and we'll be able to, let's grab my root joint, top of the hierarchy, that bottom one, way down there, okay? And if we were to reactivate the tool, check it out. We can still go back in and continue to edit them. Okay? That's really neat. Not all applications allow you to edit these in the way that, that Moto does. Okay? So Kaylee, I would recommend going back into your skeleton tool, reapplying it, and then moving all of those joints to where they need to be uh, to match the, the position of the, of the skeleton along the spine of your character. Okay? All right. Okay. All right. So um, with that said, I think now is a really great time to get a little organized. As you saw a moment ago, what we are crafting over in the item list is a crazy hierarchy, pretty intense hierarchy actually. Okay. 
This hierarchy at the moment is just named skeleton underscore joint. This is confusing, okay? We want to have a certain level of control and we want to make sure that we understand the system that we're crafting, okay? This is kind of going back to Pat's golden rule of name everything. Uh, you might understand the context of these items right now, but what if you're working on this project for, you know, 24 hours in a row, okay? And then you're so exhausted and you're tired, you go home and you sleep for like an entire day, right? And then you come back to work, you know, 24 hours later, refreshed and ready to go and energized, but you've completely forgotten the context of all of these names, okay? This is going to happen to you, trust me. It's happened to me a number of times when, when I've left things like untitled. I come back the next day and I'm like, what? What is this, you know? Yeah, what an untitled. Man, what is the role of so We want to name things, so we're kind of protecting ourselves and remember, okay? Now that we're entering into the character animation world, you're not going to be the only person working on this project file. You're ultimately going to be handing this file off to a dedicated character animator for he or she to do their thing with it, okay? So we need to make sure that the system that we craft and create is universal and can be understood by other people outside of us. Yeah. Um, okay. Let's. Can you drop your tool for me? Drop your tool. Drop your tool. Okay. Select. Let's select uh, joint number four. Okay. Now select joint number six for me. I don't, uh, can you zoom in a little bit? Aha. Okay. Chris, you did do this. Now, Chris got into a little bit of a jam here. Uh, when he was drawn his hierarchy. And let me show you something that you need to be very, very mindful of when working with the joint tool, okay? You just can't go click, 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 and just be click happy and start working around. You have to pay attention to which joint is gold, okay? Because we need to create a defined hierarchy, okay? We're making a chain here, okay? Very similar to that chain exercise that we did a couple weeks ago. I know a number of you guys are probably thinking, why in the world are we animating a chain? Well, all characters are nothing more than series of chains linked together. What's happened on Chris's is that he's, his chain has been broken. And let me see if I can find a good example. Here's joint number six. He has something like this, where it spurs, where we, get, we have the, the root, you know, our, full, our four skeleton joints. And then these two guys in here are now parented to joint number four, okay? We can't have that for the spine and for a whole series of other chains across the body. We need to have them be hierarchical, okay? Like this, okay? Now, at the end of the, here's what I would recommend, Chris, going forward, just delete the skeleton and just redraw it again, okay? All right. Um, oh, we were naming things. So let's name some, th some, some of these joints. Uh, you don't have to name them all, but there's a couple in here that I would recommend some, some all-stars, some landmark uh, chains, or some, excuse me, some landmark joints that we want to make sure that our brain kind of focuses in on. Of course, we want to name the root bone so that we can very quickly see the, uh, where this root bone is. So I'm just going to rename this guy root. Okay. All right. And let's just do this. I'm going to, instead of skeleton joint two, I'll just call this spine 01. I'm going to copy it. So select it all, copy it. And then this is going to be spine 02. O3. Oh, four. Okay, just get some granularity in here. Be specific. It will help. Okay. All right. And then we have base of neck, base, neck, top. Or shoot, let's do this. We'll do neck, top. And I'll do neck, base here on this other one. Neck, base, this will be head, top. 
Okay, there we go. That's a good little hierarchy here, okay? Very easy to understand the system that we have crafted once we have all of these guys named accurately, okay? Now, the reason why um, we did that animated chain exercise earlier uh, in the semester was to get kind of in the habit of working with elements that are connected to each other, okay? Because in many ways, our entire internal skeletal structure is nothing more than a huge system of parent-child relationships. The head bone, the top of the head bone, is connected to the neck bone, right? The top of the neck bone is connected to the neck base bone. And the neck base bone is connected to spine four, four is connected to three, three, and so forth, okay? So if we were to go in, for example, into the middle of our hierarchy, let's just grab that guy, which is spine two. Let's do a little item transformation here, check it out. If I was to rotate it, everything above it is gonna move exactly like our character should move, right? If we were to grab the, the root bone, if we were to grab the root joint way down there at the bottom in the tailbone area and do item transform to rotate it, the entire spine will move. We want this parent-child relationship between all of these joints. That way, we're getting the rotation dependencies that we need, okay? We're getting that relationship. Kind of make sense? Yeah, all right, let's keep cruising because there's a couple more things, obviously, that we need to do in here, all right? We need to do the legs. We need to do the legs. Now the legs and the arms are kind of fun, okay? I like working with the legs and the arms. Here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna double click on the root joint, and when you double click on the root joint, notice that the entire chain above it, all of the children of that joint, are also automatically selected. We want this, because we wanna continue to extend our rig. We wanna continue to extend our skeletal system to include the legs, the arms, and the hands, okay? We're gonna start off with the legs, and uh, let's just fire off the skeleton tool once again. Once we turn it back on, Moto's gonna understand that we're working with joints, so we can still go back in and edit all of these joints, which is pretty cool. I'm gonna do this in my front orthographic perspective so I can get a little accuracy with the, the placement of my joints. Moto's a pretty smart system. Actually, it's a ridiculously intelligent system. We like to use the Moto rigging tools because they really understand what the outcome is supposed to be, right? These aren't bolted on tools. They're part of the first party offering and they're, I think, just beautifully designed. And one of the things that we get access to, and because the Moto tools understand what they're trying to make, okay, we have symmetry. We have the ability to make a symmetrical joint system. The spine obviously isn't going to be symmetrical, and I'm going to sneeze. <coughs> Woo! Excuse me. Um, obviously, we don't want to have duplicate joints along the spine, which is why we did it first, right? So we can create a single chain. Well, now that we're going to start working with the arms and the legs, I don't want to have to, you know, do the plate. I want the each chain, each joint structure to be, to be identical across the, uh, the other side of our model. So we're going to turn on symmetry. Symmetry across the x-axis, like this. There we go. Symmetry. And I'm going to click on the root bone to select it. Since the root bone is selected, its control surface has gone gold. Now, anytime that I add, check it out. I'm going to add a new branch in at that section, okay? What axis did you access on to put the symmetry on? X. You got it. Now, noticing, notice where I'm trying to place these two joints. In many ways, we're kind of creating the hip socket, okay? Kind of creating the hip socket. Because at the top of our legs, they rotate around kind of right in there. So that's a good place for our joints. And that's all stemming from the root, okay? It's all stemming from the root. Okay. Um, shoot, I'm gonna hit undo because I wanna, I forgot to, I forgot to do something. Um, we were naming things earlier, okay? But check this action now. Uh, Moto's got some pretty smart rigging tools. We're gonna have it name these joints for us, okay? And we have some prefix, prefixes here that will allow us to very quickly, uh, um, very quickly, name these as we're creating them. And if symmetry is on, it'll automatically add the L and the R in there depending on which side of the model that it's in. So it makes it a little bit easier for us to consume the role of that joint just by reading the, the item name. Okay, I don't care so much about the 
um, about the prefix. Okay, so I want to turn that off because I don't want it to say skeleton. I just want it to say like leg. Okay, and I want the suffix, which is what's going to happen after the leg, to read L and R. Okay. There we go. Let me zoom out. And boom. Yeah. Reading prefix. It's still reading the prefix. If you look over here, it's still saying skeleton, root L. I don't want it to say skeleton. Read prefix. I'm sorry, can you say that again? I had the root, yeah. The legs are going to stem or branch, if you will, from that root bone. Yes, ma'am. Your symmetry is not working. Let's take a look at it, Jessica. See what we got. Because your symmetry's off. No, no, no. Okay. Yeah, I see what Jessica's doing. And this is so don't make the mistake that Jessica's making, okay? So hit undo a number of times, Jessica, to remove all of that stuff that you just did. She's going up here to the top of the screen and activating the symmetry up here, okay? Don't do this. This is no go. We don't add the symmetry up at the top of the screen. Okay? What we want to enable is the symmetry right here. Okay? Inside the tool options. Okay? This is the one. Yay. This earns a smiley face. Whee! Did you guys, did you guys know that it was Talk Like a Pirate Day? A couple days ago on Wednesday? Yesterday, Wednesday? Man, didn't know that until the end of the day. I was bummed by that. I was really, really disappointed because I could have been talking like a pirate all day and it would have been socially acceptable. Yeah. Man. Absolutely. Remember, you have to have a joint selected before we can start doing the hip joints, okay? What you got? Mm -hmm. Ah, okay. So let's hit undo for, for me for a second here. Okay. Uh, turn the tool off. Yeah, the tool off, right? You have the skeleton tool active, right? Yeah. Okay, turn it off. Drop the tool. Space bar, drop the tool. There we go. Okay, now double click on the root bone in your hierarchy. There we go. See that selects it all of it? Okay. Now turn the skeleton tool back on. See how they're, they're blue? We get the control vertices. Oh. Click on, on the root. Okay. And now, I can see they get your symmetry on. Now try drawing the hips. There it is. Okay. Yep. I think the, that maybe the issue that Tomoka was getting into is that she was trying to add the joints for her legs. She didn't double click on the root joint to select the entire chain. She just single clicked on the root. You got to double click it to select everything. Okay. All right. Let me see if I can figure out what in the world is going on here. Maybe I do want it to say prefix. I'm sorry, can you say that again, Kaylee? How do you know that the point turns out the All of them will turn orange. Well, you're already in the tool, okay? You're already working with it. That, you only want to double click on it when you're trying to reactivate the skeleton tool. Okay, so let me see what's going on here. I don't do 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 do. I want to hit undo for a moment. See, notice that my skeleton tool is turned off. Okay, I want to continue working on my skeleton, so I want to double click on it to select the entire hierarchy, activate the skeleton tool, get all my control points back again. And uh, let's see, I want to start from the root and draw the hips. Skeleton root. I don't want it to say skeleton root. I don't want the prefix. Ah, still grabbing the prefix. Let me just delete it. Root. That'll do. That, that actually may be a bug. Yeah. That actually, I, I think that's a bug. I might actually do a bug report on that one. Chris. I'm sorry, I can't say that again, man. You still 
keep getting two big wheels. Yeah, okay, drop the tool, let's hit undo, okay? Drop, no, drop the tool, yeah, there you go, okay. So drop the tool, okay, let's, let's try it again. Double click on the root, okay, activate the skeleton tool. All right, now go back to your tool properties, ensure that symmetry is on, rock and roll, ready to go, okay? So now, now we gotta, yeah, we gotta click on the root, right? Because whatever, whatever control vertice on your spine is gold is where that joint is going to be drawn from. Okay? Now, yep. Now start to go. There you go. Bam. Yeah. That little gold dot on the, uh, on the, on the joints is, can be easily missed. All right. So I want to get rid of the prefix. I don't want it to say root. I want it to say leg. And grab that one. There we go. Ah. Yeah. Okay, this is driving me crazy. There, what? No, I don't want to say joint. I want to say leg. There we go. Okay. So after a moment of frustration, I finally got what I wanted. Uh, I wanted to dig into that because I think that's a bug, or in my mind, it should not do that. Um, so now that we got our symmetry going here, I want to make sure that I'm placing these joints kind of right around where the hips would be or the hip socket would be. Okay. Once I got that kind of dialed, we're going to place another joint down here by the, by the knees. Then we'll do another one for the ankle area. At this point in the construction of our rig, I almost always like to jump over into the right viewport so I can start adjusting the location of these before I go any further. So I want to put my hips kind of in the center there, grab my knee. Put it kind of in the center, but more kind of justified towards the front. And when I say the front, I don't mean like on the actual front. Still, we want it on the interior of our mesh, but not in the dead center. Because where's your knee bone? Where's your kneecap? Excuse me. Kind of on the front of your leg, right? So it makes sense that the area, the location of rotation for your knee kind of resemble where it actually rotates on your body. From the right view, we're able to really quickly and instantly get a good understanding of where the ankle bone is. And for me, the ankle bone is that big knobby thing, okay, on the side of your foot. That's the bone, that's the location that we're trying to place this new joint in. For the leg, we're also just going to very simply put one kind of right here in the middle, and then another joint towards the ball of the foot. Uh, yeah, the ball of the foot, okay? Next week, we're going to spend a lot of time increasing the control of the foot. And we're going to create something called a reverse foot lock that will ultimately allow us to do this movement with our foot. Okay? At the, mo at the moment, we can kind of do it, okay? but it's not perfect yet. We'll talk about how to make it perfect next week. All right. So that's looking pretty good. I always like to ta check the, the uh, orientation of the feet in perspective just to make sure that we're kind of in the center or as close to the center of the foot as we can make it. On some characters, you'll find that the, the feet are kind of uh, um, splayed out at an angle. So we want to make sure that our rotation is resembled. Okay. But this is looking pretty good. I'm liking it. All right, so there's our feet. Let's drop the tool and look at what was crafted or what we have crafted. So here's our, our root bone in our item list, okay, our hierarchy. All, all roads leave from the root bone, okay? And inside the root bone, we now have three separate se sub-hierarchies. We have the spine, we have the left leg, and then we have the right leg, okay? We want to have all of these broken out into their own discrete hierarchies so we can control them independently, okay? So we can control the legs separately from the torso section of our body. Okay? So this is starting to look pretty good. I'm happy with this. I really am. This is looking good. So time to start working on establishing our arms. From what we know so far, um, where do you think we're going to have the arms spur from? Where are we going to break off the hierarchies from our arms? The shoulders. We want to have some, some defined shoulder joints so that we can rotate our arms from the shoulders. But which bone inside of my hierarchy are we going to connect those joints to? 
Say again? Top of the spine, absolutely. So this is the only hierarchy, or the only two hierarchies within our system that aren't going to be spurred from the, from the root, okay? We're going to spur these hierarchies from the spine, okay? As they would in the real world, okay? Now, why are we doing this? Why the spine? Why not the, 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 the root? Think about it. Think about how your arms move. It's connected to your spine, absolutely. And if you think about it, you know, it'll take a step, take a step forward. You know, we can, I can bend over at the waist, right, and not have my arms move at all, right? But some people, if you ever watch like Cirque du Soleil, those people are crazy. You know, they're incredibly flexible. Shoot, my son is incredibly flexible. I look, he's a one-year-old boy, and that dude can like put his ankles behind his head, and I'm like, what? Come on, that is nuts. S maybe. I'm not flexible. I can't touch my toes. I've never been able to touch my toes my entire life. So I have a lot of respect for those people. Tangent. I apologize. Um, okay. However, we can move portions of our upper torso separately from the bottom. Like I, I can rotate, kind of. <laughs> I'm a bad exemplar of this, but you can rotate from the center of your the center of your chest, right? Center of your chest. Okay. I'm kind of rotating around around the bottom of my rib cage right now. I'm trying the best I can, okay? So we don't want to have our shoulders connected to our root because if we were to move our root, then we're forced into rotating our shoulders around that area. We're isolating the arms and the shoulders from the rest of the body by spurring it from the top of the spine. Whenever we're designing any sort of control rig, a skeletal, a skeletal system, we want to try to have our system resemble as close as we can our actual skeletal system, okay? So if you're doing a character, like I know Sean's working on a crazy alien character right now, okay? Just for his, just for his own professional life. And it's looking really great, the model looks awesome. Like he's getting really close, probably within the next week or so, where he probably can start infusing a control rig into the mix, okay? But it's an alien. You know? Well, even aliens have to have, uh, even aliens have to have bones or something that's gonna determine their movement, right? So we can use a little inspiration from our actual skeletal system to do that. Same with like insects and bugs and horses and dogs. We had to look at those quadruped uh, kind of skeletal systems to kind of give us an inspiration as how these really kind of fictitious fantasy creatures should also move. Okay. Gelatinous blobs. Um, I don't know, man. That'd be a tough one. Yeah, they're always in motion, right? Yeah. Could be. Yeah, could be. I love it. All right. So let me uh, let me grab the root joint yet again for uh, for my guy here. There we go. I double click every I double click on the root and notice that it's it's selecting everything. It's grabbing both the legs and the spine. You can reactivate the skeleton skeleton too, and that's my guy right there. That one's base of neck, so that's the top of the spine. So let's kind of define. And I got my symmetry on, so I want to do this. I don't want it to call. Uh, here we go. I messed it up. There we go. So now we're going to do shoulders. And clearly we don't want it to call be called spine, so let's call it arm. Or there we go. No, joint. Okay, I'm bugging this. This is crazy. I did. Yeah. It's only updating after I click, which maybe is the way it's supposed to work, but I think that's stupid. Okay. I have some opinions on it, as you can see. Okay, so there's a good one for the shoulders. Of course, we want to rotate our arm around the elbow, and then we need one over here at the wrist. As we work in towards the fingers, we want to start getting a certain granularity with the precision and the placement of these joints initially. Um, before we go too much further, let's look at our, our model from the top and ensure that the placement of these joints is where we want it to be. And I'm clearly off, okay? So let's just fix it real fast. Something like that. Okay. Question? Very much in the back. Okay. Um, so drop your tool and, or, yeah, drop your tool and then just grab your, your root joint there. And in item mode, move it to your, to your spine. Item mode? Item mode. You're in item mode. Now just move it up towards your body. Okay. Then, you know, then you'll be able to go from there. Okay, 
Now you'll have some additional editing that you'll have to do going forward, Kaylee, but at least it's now in the same region of your three-dimensional scene. Okay. And Kaylee, I think this next step is really going to help you, okay? Because Kaylee's having some problems getting her joints to show up on the interior of her mesh as she's clicking on them, okay, from the front view. So let me show you a really cool addition to the Moto rigging tools that will help, especially when we're working with small areas on our rig, like the fingers, okay? I want to have a lot of joints in the fingers, right? Because if you think about it, each finger is going to get four separate joints. It's a lot of joints in a small area. So I want to be able to place these joints with a certain degree of accuracy initially, okay? We have a tool in here called Intersection, and I love Intersection. If you look over in your tool properties on the left hand side of the screen, you can see there we have intersection. If we turn it on, Moto is going to start to do something that's really rad. And I've never seen this before in any other applications. And for the rigging tools, this kind of, this kind of really makes me smile. With the intersection uh, option enabled, Moto is going to fire off a ray wherever you click on the mesh, right? It's going to fire off a ray. That ray is going to penetrate all the meshes that are active, okay, in your item list. And it's going to look, it's basically kind of like a bullet, okay, and that bullet's going to go on the, it's going to hit the outside of your, uh, it's going to be like an entry point, and then an exit point for that ray, okay. So the bullet's going to go into your skin, and then it's going to leave the skin, okay. Well, since it's a ray, and since Moto is really smart, it's going to calculate the middle point between those two entry and exit points, and automatically place the joint in the middle. Okay, let me show you what I'm talking about. All right, with the intersection tool on, let's just jump over here. Oops, I'm going the wrong way. All right, let's do, okay, now I'm going to have uh, a joint here in the middle of my palm, okay, because in, in reality, most of your fingers rotate around the middle of your palm, okay or we want to be able to control the fingers you know, as we rotate that way. Okay. So middle of the palm, look where it automatically put that joint for me. It put it dead center in the middle of the palm, rock and roll. Okay. So now I'm free to start working on the, uh, the index finger. And this is a cartoony guy. It's uh, more expensive for us to animate five fingers than it is four, which is why we only have four. That's the myth, that's the, the pervasive myth in the animation industry. It's like, why does Bugs Bunny or Mickey Mouse only have four fingers? Well, because adding a fifth would be more expensive. You know? <laughs> uh, okay, so now we can go ahead, and so there's the knuckle. And let's see, we've got to have the knuckle, and then we've got to have one in here. Okay, then one, there's another rotation point kind of in there, and then we want to have one at the tip. If we look carefully... Moto has automatically placed those joints in the middle of our finger. Because intersection was on, it fired off a ray, it figured out where the ray was going to enter the, uh, the mesh, and where that ray exited the meth mesh, and it calculated the, the center distance, and it placed that joint for us. Pretty cool. So let's go back to this one here, the center of my palm, if you will. And we'll do another four. So we got the knuckle. And this model doesn't have a really defined middle knuckle. Something maybe right in there, and the tip. Okay. And it's doing an okay job. It's not perfect. It's not perfect, but it does a pretty decent job for the most part. We'll go back to the palm. Do the pinky finger. And visually, I'm just trying to break my, th my fingers into thirds. Something like that. Let's see how the, the intersection tool did. Yeah, it did okay. Not too shabby. Not too shabby. Yeah, go back to that joint in the palm. Okay. So if you look carefully at what I've crafted here, that's how your finger should be laid out. We have a, uh, a joint over here that's going to be what I call the palm. And then that one is going to go that way to all the knuckles. Okay. And then each knuckle is going to go down to the tip of the finger. Okay, we got to do the thumb, can't forget about the thumb, but the thumb actually rotates around a really odd spot. If you just look at your thumb for a second and do this type of movement with your thumb, where is it rotating around? Like right here. 
Yeah, it's the wrist. It's not rotating around the center of your hand like a number of your fingers are, okay? It's rotating. I can see it on mine. I got a pretty crazy tendon for my thumb, and I can see that tendon kind of terminating in my wrist, and that's where my thumb is rotating around, okay? So that's where we want to spur the entire rotation, or excuse me, the entire joint chain for the, for the thumb from. So let me grab my wrist. There it is right there. And then we'll do the same structure for the thumb. So we'll go there, middle, and, uh, and end. There we go. Ta -da! There's my thumb. With the intersection on, it did a really darn good job of finding out where the center of that mesh is and placing the joints for me. Now, you can, this is kind of the cool thing about this, the system is that if it made a mistake, just go back and fix it real fast. There's our hand. Like, I don't think it did a perfect job for all of these guys. <laughs> I can't hear you, Alex. Can you say that again? Absolutely. If you want to, you know, that's a detail that you probably won't see in the fingers because that area is so small, but you're more than welcome to. If you want to justify the, the knuckles, uh, the joints that define the knuckles kind of towards the top of your, of your finger, I say do it. Absolutely. Now, what in the world is compensation doing? Okay. If you notice, I, on my, what I'm going to call my middle finger there, I had to go in and adjust each joint independently from each other because I wanted to bring them all down to kind of more in the middle of, of, the, of the finger, right? Well, compensation is basically allowing us the, uh, the ability to go in and edit these independently from each other, okay? So I can go in and grab this joint in the middle of the chain and the joint over here and over here is not being affected. Well, if we turn compensation off, okay, check it out. Now anything that we make towards the middle is going to influence all of the children above it in the chain, or excuse me, below it in the chain, okay? So now anything that we make in the middle of our skeletal structure is going to influence the elements that are connected down, okay, down in the hierarchy. You got it. You got it. And at times, you want to be able to go in and very quickly adjust the location of entire sections, okay? You know, what if you messed up and you just need to globally change, like, the height of the arm and move, and you want, you know, and, uh, or maybe you're recycling a rig and you're taking this skeletal structure and you're applying it to another character that has different proportions, okay? Um, making global changes to your entire hierarchy can, is made real easy by turning compensation off, okay? All right. Since I had symmetry on, check it out. The other side of my body is already done. Okay? Pretty cool, huh? Pretty cool. This really is the power of the moto rigging system. If I was doing this without any explanation, without teaching you guys, I probably could flush out the rig for this, the skeletal rig, in about five minutes. Okay? It makes the whole process go really fast. And when we start pairing the, the awesome uh, skeleton tool with some of these really powerful options like intersection and compensation and the ability to change the names of the joints, it becomes really, really quick and really easy. Let's look at our, our hierarchy here real fast and take a look see at what we've accomplished. Okay? I'm going to collapse my spine. You can see we have the root, and we have our spine, and then we have two separate hierarchies for the legs. Next week we're going to spend a lot of time, a lot of time working on the legs. Uh, we're going to add the ability to add IK handles so we can do squats and what have you. Um, we're going to add a lot, a lot of stuff next week when it comes to the legs and the arms to a certain degree. Okay, so it's nice that we have those broken out and separated from the rest of the mesh. And then if we keep cruising through the spine, let's go through the spine. Here's spine two, three, four, and then right here at spine four, check it out. Spine four branches or spurs into three separate hierarchies. One hierarchy for the rest of the head, right? For the neck, the neck top, and head top, okay? And then we have two other separate hierarchies that are dedicated for each arm, okay? Make sense? Make sense so far? All right. Hmm, that's no good. That's no good. 
All right, questions, questions, questions. Yeah, Seth. Um, like from my thumb, I attached it to the palm instead of the wrist. Yeah. Um, so what if we need to make a change? What if we what if we parented those joints to the wrong to the wrong parent? Okay, parent to the wrong parent. We connected those joints to the wrong parent. That's what I was trying to go for. Um, so remember, all we're all we've really done here is created a really fancy series of parent-child relationships. So if you have the correct sequence, unparent it. Okay, you can unparent all those all those thumb joints from the from the the palm one, and then parent them back to the wrist. So you can do that through the item list. Sorry, Seth. So after you skeletonize your model. Oh, I love that. I am totally stealing that. <laughs> skeletonize my model. I am stealing that going forward. That's a good one, Kaylee. <laughs> Thank you. Anyways, after you skeletonize your model, you get to do the rest of the modeling, like shaping them, correct? Kind of, a little bit. You want to be done with the overall modeling of your character by the time you get to this point, okay? You don't want to model on top of a character that's already been rigged. You'll see why here momentarily, okay? So you should be done, done, done with the modeling of your character before you rig it. Okay. All right, let's take a look at the, at the outcome, what we've achieved in this process. Okay. So what we've created in this process is really an independent skeleton from the rest of our body, okay? And uh, the location of all these joints allow us to control our entire skeleton globally with the root. Double clicking on the root allows me to very quickly go in. And, oops, excuse me. There we go. Well, that's fun. I'm moving all of them. I, wanted, I don't want to double click on it. I just want to grab the root. Excuse me. Thank you. And now, by grabbing the root, I'm on my way. Okay, I can rot move and rotate this thing globally around the scene, which is rock and roll. Okay. I can go grab specific portions of my character, like the arm, and move it how I want. Okay. But as you can see, the one thing that isn't moving is my character. Okay, we have some issues here. We have some issues. The next step in this process, I want to hit undo, is getting our character, the actual mesh, to be connected to our skeleton. Okay? And, and we'll go over that after the break. So let's take a break. Hold on two seconds. I gotta do something real fast. I got something new for you guys. Here we go. It's gonna keep us honest. Yeah, coming.
Let's get back to it, shall we? Here we go. All right, all right. So, um, before we took our little break, mission accomplished on skeleton. Wait, woo! We made our first skeleton. It looks pretty good. Um, but we have some problems in front of us still. We need to be able to go in and connect this skeleton to our mesh. This process is called binding. So we're physically going to make a connection between the skeleton joints that we've crafted and the geometry uh, of our character. Okay? Now this is where all of our problems stem from. The process of binding our skeleton to our mesh is going to generate some issues. So I encourage you to enter into this process with an, with an open mind. You may have to do this two or three times to find the right recipe, if you will, uh, for success. Okay? The one thing that we have to do, and we need to ensure that, we're, we, that we have uh, done, is that we need to select the entirety of our skeleton. So this is where double clicking on the root joint is really kind of invaluable, because it's going to select all of its children, which is, in every sense, every single joint on our skeleton. So double click, select the entirety of your skeleton. Once you have your skeleton selected, we're going to uh, hold down the shift key and click on our mesh itself. So hold down the shift key, click on the mesh, and we're on our way. Okay, that's the easy part of the character binding process. The next thing that we have to do is enter into a new mode. Okay, And I really wish they had figured out a, a different way to, to name all these because it definitely adds to a certain level of confusion when working inside of Moto. So we have the setup tab, we have the setup tools, and now we have the setup mode. <laughs> the setup mode okay, can be entered into pretty easily at the top of the setup tab. Yeah, I understand. Yeah, I understand the belly aching. and it definitely is a little bit of an issue. And there it is right there. There is the button that allows us entry into setup mode. Okay. You can also hit the, re, uh, the return key on your number pad. Oops, that's the wrong thing. Uh, you can also hit the return key on your number pad to generate setup mode, okay, or to activate setup mode, okay. Setup mode, once we enter into it, changes our OpenGL viewport, okay. So now that you know how to turn on setup mode, let's look at the differences on screen so that you're visually aware that you're in setup mode, because from time to time we want to enter into setup mode, but for like 90% of the time, we don't want to be in setup mode, okay? What's happened to my OpenGL port here? I would say it's more yellowish, but maybe to Chevy's eyes it looks green, okay? But yeah, there's an outline around our OpenGL port. okay? Uh, my brain is telling me it looks kind of yellow. In addition, if you look at the background color, come on in, gentlemen, or just Mr. Wilson. Oh, plus one, who's behind you? Let's all look at Greg. Greg, you ignored the countdown timer. I'm joking. Don't worry about it. It's all good. <laughs> it feels as though I should like have some sort of sound effect that accompanies like the countdown timer. So like when it gets to ten, it's like meh, 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 you know. And then if you hear the the awesome sound effect, you know, like the run back to class, pass about to start. Yeah, exactly. That'd be cool. Yeah, right. That'd be fun. Okay. You know, I'm always down for an explosion. I really am. Uh, I, you know, I, I can't tell you how many times I've asked our administration to let me blow things up. Surprisingly, every time they said no. I mean, I mean, come on. Who do they, who do they think they're working with here? I'll be safe. I'll wear safety goggles. Come on. Okay. Anyways. Um, I mean, you got these I have a chance. I, they gave me 3D printers, so they should at least allow me to use explosions from time to time. I can figure out. I can figure out how to work with it. Okay. Anyway. Yeah. Me too. <laughs> it works in my brain. Um, so, in addition to having an outline, this yellow outline, uh, jump around your OpenGL viewport, the background color of your environment has also changed. Okay. When you're outside of setup mode, check it out. The background color is kind of a lighter gray. It's subtle, okay? It's kind of a lighter, uh, kind of desaturated gray. And then when we enter into setup mode, it changes to kind of more of a darker bluish gray. It's a subtle little reminder that you're now in a mode that is very, very specific towards the binding process, okay? What we're doing here is that we're kind of creating a mode that uh, determines 
the master default position of our character. Okay, in many ways, this is kind of like the reset button. Okay, if we want our character to go back to its T pose, we go back into setup mode, and we can make some additions to the to the initial bind pose. Okay. You're, we're going to talk a lot about this next week when we start to extend our control rig uh, to include some really advanced features. But for today, we need to be in setup mode in order to connect the skeleton to the character. Okay? This entire binding process is not going to happen if we're not in setup mode. So hit that setup button. Now that I'm in setup mode and I have all of my elements selected, I can go back into my, into my rigging tools. And specifically, where we're going is the Modifiers tab. All right. So here's Modifiers. And da 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 da. Uh, OK, I made a liar out of me. Modifiers, that's totally like the 601 way. It's in Deformers. And it's not in Deformers. It's in Waiting now. I'll find it here in a minute. I'm just having a massive brain dump at the moment. I'm looking for Bind. It's under deformers. Okay, so I'm not going crazy. It's just I was I, so okay. My bad. That one's on me. So this is what happens when you zoom in. Even you know it's the end of the week for me. My brain's turning into like a fried egg. Okay, so there it is. It's at the top. <laughs> it's at the top of the deformers tab. And what we're looking for is this bind command. Okay, so to go to deformers, the bind command. Now once you click on it. You're going to generate this popover, and this popover is going to allow us to change which type of, uh, or it's basically it's going to allow us to change the rules, and these rules, are, these rules are going to change how our, these rules are going to determine what part of the mesh each one of our bones is going to influence. Okay. Now there's some really great ones in here. There's a magical one called heat. Okay. I always try heat first and see what I get. Sometimes it works magically on characters, other times it doesn't. I'm hoping that it doesn't, so at the very least you can see the failure of the system, and then we can go back and do it again. Okay. So I want to change my bind type from smooth distance to heat. There we go. And then we'll hit OK. All right. OK, let's enter out of setup mode. There we go. And let's select, I don't know, I'm going to grab part of my spine. Now, you have to be out of setup mode to get access to this. So once we're out of setup mode, hey, there it is. It worked. It worked. OK. Now our character, or excuse me, now our skeleton has been physically connected to the mesh of our geometry. OK. All right. And now we can go in. And I always like just to kind of test it see what's going on. Grab these guys. Yeah, all right. So it's kind of working. Let's grab the hips. So rotate the hips, see what happens. All right, not too, not horrible. It's not great, but it's not horrible. Woo, I'm a pretty ballerina. Okay. So what in the world is going on? What have we just done? In every essence, what we've accomplished here is that we have taken all of those individual joints and we've assigned them areas of influence. Okay? We've basically said the vertices that are immediately surrounding this joint are going to be moved or rotated or scaled when that joint is moved or rotated or scaled. Okay? There's a great way for us to very quickly go in and see which joints are influencing uh, which parts of our mesh. And I'm going to undo my pretty ballerina here. And we're going to enable some viewport properties that will help. Check it out. If I hit the O key to bring up, open my viewport properties, under drawing and control, we want to turn on... Where is it? Did they change this? They probably did. Under visibility now? Where did it go? Do -do 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 -do. Is it topology? No, it's not topology mode. Replicators, GL background. Help me out. Seth, you had it on your screen. Where did it go? My brain is just not uh, active meshes. This is probably where we're Vertex map. Here we go. Let's grab the weight. Um, show weight maps. 
Why are we not seeing my pretty rainbow color? Hold on a sec. I'll get there. Like I said, it's the end of the day. Oh, I'm in the wrong. I got to be in open GL, advanced open GL. That's why. I was in my, my viewport properties were set to shaded. You got to be in advanced open GL. And then when you double click on any joint, and I think you have to have show weight maps on. Okay, so inside of your viewport property under active meshes, you need to have show weight maps enabled. And then whenever you click on a joint, it'll show you the areas along the mesh that that joint is influencing. For example, if I grab the shoulder, you can see the red areas. Only the red areas of the mesh are going to be influenced by that joint. So if I was to rotate my shoulder, it's really going to uh, influence the vertices kind of right around the shoulder. Excuse me, right around the shoulder, all the way over here to the elbow. Yes, ma'am. Um, well, Let's check it out. Let's see what's going on. Okay. Find. Eat. Okay. 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 Yep. So Tomoka's making the critical error here. Okay. And Tomoka is trying to test her rig as I was testing it a moment ago. Tomoka, here's the, the result. You've got to go out of setup mode. Okay. Yeah. Click on that setup mode button again to go out of it. Go out of setup mode. Turn it off. Okay. Now rotate your spine. There it is. Okay. So you're, you're only really inside of setup mode when you're binding the skeleton to the mesh. Once you've bound the skeleton to the mesh, Hit that setup button again and get out of it so you can test to see if the bind operation actually occurred. It takes a little bit getting used to, and I admittedly it takes a lot getting used to, but we'll get there. You'll, you'll get better at it. Trust me, you'll get better at it. Okay. <clears throat> okay. All right. Questions? Yeah. Uh, so You got a whole bunch of wacky things. Let's check it out. Let's see what we got. I like wacky joints. Yeah. <laughs> no clue. Nice. That's a fun one. Okay. So really what, what's happening on Mr. Wilson's, and this is actually, or Mr. May's screen, this is actually a, a beautiful segue beautiful. to what I want to talk about. <laughs> He's rotating the thumb, and half of his index finger is also rotating. Dude, so. Keep it. That's going to look amazing. OK. Let's take a look at how we can fix it. Excuse me. Let's take a, let's take a look at how we can fix this. OK. So we have, we have some tools in here that will allow us to fix these problems. The binding tools are seemingly magical, but really they're based on an algorithm, okay? And this algorithm is automatically going through and is trying to figure out which vertices need to be influenced by specific joints on our skeleton, okay? And in, and in the case of Mr. May, it got it wrong, okay? The computer just messed up. It didn't do a really great job, and it assigned vertices to the, that were on the index finger to be influenced by the rotation of the thumb, which clearly we don't want to have happen. Let me see if I can find a similar joint like that on my skeleton. Yeah, okay, let me just see if we... Okay. Problems like this are probably more than likely going to happen on the fingers where things are close to one another. Okay. Okay. Let me show you, actually, now that we have this done, instead of selecting each joint, let me show you a really, really, really cool way to very quickly go in and see if all the joints are working the way they need to be working, okay? This is actually going to allow us to play with a really neat tool. It's been around since 601, uh, and it's called the Pose Tool. The Pose Tool is a great way for us to almost instantly go in and apply some really great movements and some uh, uh, poses to our characters. 
Um, it's really easy to use. You know, so I like doing it just to test the rig. So now that we've got everything bound, I'm going to select my root. I want to turn off show weight maps for the moment. There we go. Oops. And here's the, the post tool. It's in the second row. It's that one right there. And the moment we turn it on, check it out. All of our control surfaces are going to get this cool little dot on it. And this dot is going to allow us to move portions of that guy like that. Yeah, I had the root selected. I double clicked on the root to grab it. Um, what we're doing here is that the computer is applying what's called full body IK, and it's moving the entire chain based on uh, some really fancy rules. However, you know, I want to test my elbow here, and I don't want my entire arm moving around, right? So we're going to deactivate the full body IK from being from influencing the rest of my mesh by right clicking on the right click by right clicking there we go by right clicking on top or command clicking which is the right clicking on the shoulder joint now let me hit undo excuse me now when I move this one see how it's not the movement of my elbow is not influencing the rest of the body okay this is a really quick way to go in and see what's happening and my elbow's got some issues. It's got a lot of issues that I need to work on. Okay. If we go in and start to look at all the hands here, let's see, I'm going to turn off that control surface there. And what happens if I start working with my thumb? Yeah, whoa. Whoa was right. So you definitely wouldn't want to animate with this on, but you absolutely can't. It's a great tool to use when you're posing. And you have to have a whole skeleton system. Yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's not the, it's not going to give you a lot of accuracy. But if you're just testing things, this is a kind of a cool tool to use. And I seem to have done too good of a job when establishing my rig. So I'm going to drop the tool and hit undo a couple times to get rid of all those mistakes. Get my guy back, there we go, to our bind post. So how do we edit? How do we edit these vertex maps, these influenced areas on, on our skeleton? And this is what Mr. May needs to do to fix his kind of awesome thumb problem, OK? Yeah? Can we rebind it? Uh, you can rebind it, but at times, that may just present the exact same result. So the better idea is just to go in and edit what you have. Give it a go and see what happens. Go to ha see what happens. You know, there is a, there's definitely kind of a process of exploration that you have to go through to figure out what series of rules you're going to need to apply to your during your bind operation to get the best results on your character. Um, I like heat. Heat does a really great job. Um, but sometimes I've had situations where smooth distance gives me a better result. If you want to start over and remove 100% of your vertex maps in those, uh, in those relationships, check it out. We now have a new folder, OK? The moment we added, a, the moment we added or the moment we bound our geometry to our skeleton, check it out. We've got this deformers tab popping up. And we have this normalizing folder. If we were to open it, here are, there's what we've, in essence, have done is that top of the screen, top right-hand corner of the screen, kind of over next to your item list. It's called the formers. What we've done, in essence, is that we've created a whole series of vertex maps, a lot of them. Actually, a vertex map per joint in our chain. And here they all are. And you can select them. You can click on them if you'd like. Like if I grab uh, neck top, OK? And if I change my OpenGL viewport to view the vertex maps, you'll see the areas of influence that that vertex map is responsible for, OK? Vertex maps allow us to do some really, really cool, cool movements and some cool things inside of Modo. And uh, ideally, at its core, they're just vertexes. They're vertices that have a weight associated with them. That weight is then deformed in the case of character rigging, OK? It's moved. It's rotated. That's all it's really doing, OK? If we want to kind of completely redo our smooth bind, okay, what we'll have to do is just delete this normalizing folder. There we go. We've removed all of our vertex maps. 
Let's just ensure. Yep, now it's no longer connected. Okay, so we'll go back into setup mode. Grab all of my all of my joints. Grab my character. We'll hit bind, and maybe this time smooth distance is what we want to use. There it is. Once you see that normalizing folder pop up in your deformers tab, you know that the bind operation has been completed and all the vertex maps have been generated for each joint on your rig. Okay, let's get out of uh, setup mode and see what happened. Go. And let's see. Yeah, okay, here's a great, great example. Using smooth distance, check it out. You can see that here on my shoulder, when I rotate my shoulder, half of my body also moves. Okay? Yeah, can you see that? It's, it's kind of difficult to see in, at the moment. Let me turn the visibility of my chain off. Okay? On the screen here, you can see, uh, let, me, let me just do this. You see how over here on the head, there's a whole bunch, the, all the polygons are like this really, really light, light, light pink. Okay? That color, red, represents a, um, a vertex map value. Okay? Pure red is a 100% value. Pure green is 0% value. All the shades of red in between there are going to give you different percentages of, uh, of influence. Ideally, when I click on my shoulder, I shouldn't see light pink polygons anywhere, you know, or let me rephrase that. I should only see dark, dark, dark red polygons around the area of the shoulder that I want to move when I rotate my shoulder joint, okay? When I move my, when I move my shoulder joint, I don't want my head to move, right? Because that would be kind of silly to do this if you're trying to rotate your arm. That'd be kind of stupid, okay? So we want to remove that influence from, from occurring. This is the monkey grunt work of character rigging. <laughs> uh, I mentioned earlier that character rigging is, is a, it, it isn't a glamorous job. It's incredibly technical. It takes a special type of person to be really good at character rigging. And at times, there's a lot of repetition. This is, this, this is the most frustrating, aggravating stage inside of the art of character rigging. And that's adjusting the weight maps, the vertex weight maps. Because in essence, what we have to do is to almost go into every joint and see exactly which areas of the mesh are, con are being controlled by the rotation of that joint. Okay? So there's some monkey work in here, okay? There's, it's not difficult, but it's just you got to go in and check it out, okay? Let me, let me kind of set the expectation. There is no automatic way to do this, okay? There is no magical button that we press. There's no magical pixie dust that we can, you know, sprinkle on top of our models to make them work correctly. You have to do this yourselves, okay? No. You're almost always going to have to go in and check it. Absolutely. Sometimes I find that the heat bind method does a pretty decent job. Like when I, when I was using the heat bind method, I didn't get, you know, that where half of my body, half of my head, and half of my shoulder was assigned to the rotation of the shoulder. Okay. Heat is a really, really, really cool method that gives you workable results pretty quickly. However, at times, heat isn't going to work. For example, if you have an opening in your mesh, okay, like this happens a lot when you have characters with that, uh, that you, where the mouth has been modeled, and there's an opening in the mouth, right? So they didn't like close the back of the throat, and there's an open polygon back there. Heat goes, nope, I can't do this. No, 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 I don't understand how to deal with that opening, and it fails every single time. And if you, and if you weren't the person that modeled it, if you don't know that there's an opening, there's almost no way to see if there's an opening. I mean, it's just, it's, it turns into a nightmare pretty quickly. <laughs> it does. Yeah. Not for just one area. Okay. Yeah. You need to get rid of the whole thing. Get rid of the whole thing. Or, you know, I don't want, this is a great example. I need to go in and fix this, okay? I don't want, you know, half of my head to move when I rotate my shoulder. So really what we have to do is we have to edit the existing vertex maps, not make new ones. Because if you make a new one, there's a very high likelihood that that problem is just going to be recreated again. So we've got to go in and edit and fix, and fix the ones that we have. So... Here's my little problem. Now, you want to do all of this when you're in setup mode. So let's go back into setup mode. And the cool thing about setup mode, check it out. 
is that it's going to remember the initial location of all of your joints when you did that bind. What happened to my arm? Was there a little bit of pink on it too? Yep, it went pink, but it also moved back to its original T pose, right? It moved back to its original bind pose automatically. That's one of the cool things about setup mode is that I can completely deform and move all of my joints, okay? I rotated my shoulder out, and then when I go back into setup mode to make a, make a correction to the rig, it restores it to the original setup pose, gives me a nice work environment to make the change, and then when I exit setup mode, those changes will automatically be applied to my animation, okay? So when you're editing vertex maps, you want to make sure that you're in setup mode, okay? Now that we're ready to start working uh, with these vertex maps, let's go in and check it out here, okay? We're, we're going to go into the waiting, the waiting tab and setup. And uh, these, and thank you, thank you, thank you, lords of Modo, the lords of Luxology, for adding the symmetry tool in here. Okay, in 601, you couldn't do this, okay? And it drove me crazy. Drove me crazy because you'd have to do the left side and then you have to go back in and repaint the right side. Now with the symmetry stuff on, you can do both sides simultaneously. Yay! Okay, so let's go ahead and do it real fast. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to grab, let's turn symmetry on the X. Um, in the weight map, let's see. You should be able to just go in and start painting on them. I'm just going to grab the paint tool, okay? And like, like we know before, right, uh, holding on the right mouse button and left clicking and drag will allow us to paint on the mesh, okay? And check it out. I'm just left clicking and dragging and I'm painting areas of influence, okay? So what's going to happen now? Yeah, okay, let's check it out. I want to drop the tool, exit setup mode, and let me just grab that shoulder joint again can see that that area is being heavily influenced. Yeah. Although this one isn't. I'm think, I, I might be on the wrong weight map because it should be moving this part of the body too. Interesting. Well, that's good. However, okay, so this is what we want to do. Let's go in, grab our paint tool, turn on symmetry, weight maps, we shouldn't have to select any of these because I don't even know which one it is. But let's just double check. They may have changed this in the most recent version. So it's arm R. I did. I clicked on the joint. Yeah, but I'm, I'm selecting the actual vertex map. There's a bazillion vertex maps uh, that we have to manage now. Arm R. I'll find it in my list. There it is. Arm R. So now, if I was to paint, oh, that's kind of what I expected it to do. And it's going to crash on me. I'm also streaming, which is killing my performance. Okay. Wait for it. Wait for it. It may crash. There's one setting that we want to turn off in here, and it's called Live Deformers. Live Deformers really, you know, if you have a high-end machine with a really beefy graphics card, Live Deformers does a really great job of going in. And it's in your tool properties, or it used to be in your tool properties. There it is. Thank you. There it is, Live Deformers. Thank you, Mr. May. Uh, live deformers just kills your performance. And that's exactly what I was expecting to see. Let's enter into setup mode. Awesome. Yeah. So when I rotate that shoulder joint, check it out. It's rotating the other side of the body. I, I got to apologize. I think the, the reason why it wasn't demonstrating that earlier is because I was in setup mode. Okay. This is what we don't want to don't have happen. Let's go back into setup mode. And grab our paint tools, okay? And so when you left mouse button, okay, you're going to paint. When you uh, hold down the control key, you're going to take away areas of influence, okay? And I'll try doing live deformers again. So just doing the left mouse button is going to paint areas of influence, okay? So it's going to paint red. If you were to hold down the control key, we subtract areas of influence, okay? I'm just going to paint these out. 
Okay, huzzah. And I'm gonna look critically at what, my, what I got going on. I don't want this part of my mesh to move. I'm gonna move my shoulders. I do want a little deformation underneath the armpit. Go. Certainly don't want that part of my body to move. So happy the symmetry thing is back. You have to you used to have to do it with a script to mirror the weight maps. So happy you don't have to do that anymore. There we go. Now I don't want any of the head. I want to just remove all of this vertex map uh, values here. Now, I went a little bit crazy on the shoulder. I want the shoulder to, to move. And this is kind of where having this paintbrush makes it easy. Because I can just very quickly go in, paint areas of influence. I want a little bit of the shoulder. I'm using a graphics tablet, which I would encourage you to do, because the pressure sensitivity of the graphics tablet is going to determine the values that are painted on. I'm stroking just very softly here. And it's just barely giving me some, uh, some values. If I was to really press hard, it would paint in much more. Go. Just very quickly. Say again? Right mouse click. Right mouse click and drag. Okay, let me get rid of all this stuff. All right. Oops. This is where having the symmetry on is, uh, yeah, probably not the best idea. There we go. Let's drop the tool. I can't hear you, Kaylee. Say again. That's a much other time. So now that, we're, now that we're done, yes, look at that. Let's figure out why in the world that's happening. Looks like we still have some dependencies in there. There's a couple vertices that still need to be tweaked. So let's see if we can find them inside of our system. Okay. So at times, figuring out which vertices are moving is, uh, can be a little bit of a problem. Okay. Uh, this is going to give you gray hairs. Okay, it really, really is. At times, this is going to make you go crazy. So let me make a suggestion. Work inside of, like, I don't want any of this. If you work with vertices selections. Oops, excuse me. Okay, I've selected a whole series of vertices over there. Okay, and now check it out. Over here inside of our weighting tools, we can set a value to those vertices, and I want to set the value to be zero. Value zero, click, and it should have worked. And only the vertices that we have, there we go, selected should get that, that value. Yeah, we're getting better. We're getting better. We still got some, some rogues in here. So let me select the ones that look to be the problem. Oops. Let's say a step in the right direction. There we go. So my, uh, the issue that I had was I had normalized weights active. And uh, when you normalize your weights, you're basically adding a value on top of an existing value. So if the, if the vertex value was 50 and you normalized it to zero, it'd be like 50 plus zero, okay? So it'd stay at 50. So when I turned off normalized values and said, it, said you're zero now, it reduced everything to that, to that number. Okay, now, um, I should have done that in setup mode, but you can do it outside of setup mode. It's just a little bit, a little bit more difficult, a little bit more taxing on your system, and ha-ha, there it is. Now it's working the way it should be working. 
Okay. Much better. Let's do another one. See if we can find a problem here. Let's do like the hips. The hips sometimes. Okay. Here's a great example. I selected my left hip. Let's go into setup mode. And you can see from the screen here that this, the rotation of the left hip has a lot of influence on the other leg. So right now, because part of this leg is pink, yeah, we're getting that. That's no good. Okay, we can't have that. We can't have that. Okay, so we got to fix our vertex map. So let's go back into setup mode, select that hip, and start working with our weights to get the result that we that we want. So again, I'm in the weighting tab, and there's a couple different things you can do. If you really, I mean, I'm a big fan of of the paint weights. Physically grabbing the paint tools and going in and adjusting all of that information. I think that's really kind of neat, okay? However, um, that set value is a really great way of working, okay? It begins and ends with the vertex selection. So I'm just gonna go in and just select all of these verts on this side of the leg. There we go, that looks good. Now I'm just gonna go set value. I'll look at my tool options. Make sure that normalize weights is turned off. Click, click. There we go. I guess with the paint, excuse me. It's also the weight tool. Let me show you what the weight tool looks like. There we go. Ta -da. Um, there's also adjust weights, which is kind of fun. Just weights kind of does the exact same thing, and that's really where I was, what I was looking for. Uh, I'm going to let me grab some of these verts in here. Check it out. I don't want any sort of rotation of these vertices when I rotate that hip. Okay, so if I turn on the adjust weights tool, it's actually giving you a numerical reading of what the weight values for those vertices are. So this one's got 14.127, 14.10, 14 14.1. All of those should be zero. We shouldn't have any influence or the rotation of, of that hip should have no influence on those vertices. So inside the tool properties, we can just do weight is zero, and then once we click, or we left click and drag, we can interactively adjust them, okay? Or if we turn off additive, just putting the value that we want in that field here, and then clicking will give us the result that we're after. Let's do a couple more. I don't want any of these in here to be, let me just grab them. I don't want any of these guys to be influenced. Oops. Might help if I had the right keyboard shortcuts established. There we go. Definitely don't want the same thing on the back. Let's grab all of those. If I had a mouse, this is probably something you want to do with a mouse. If I had a mouse right now, the middle mouse button will definitely would definitely be my friend. So now, adjust weights. You can see all their weight values. Some of them are zero, some of them are not zero, especially on the back. Well, they're all zero now because I accidentally clicked, excuse me. But I could put them all to 100% if I wanted. But that's not what I want, right? I want them all to be zero. Now, when I leave setup mode, and grab my, oops, excuse me, let me grab my, my joint here. Only, it's only going to influence half of the body. Oops, looks like I missed a couple. Looks like I missed a couple down there at the bottom. So this is where the madness of this turns into, because now it turns into a chore of, of finding all the vertices that are responsible. There we go. Let's adjust their weights. Just put them at zero, click. Just gonna think about it. And why didn't that update? I can't hear a single thing you're saying, Alex. No, that's, 
No. No, it's, it, this, is a, this is a vertex map dependency problem. Okay. Absolutely. This is a vertex map dependency problem. Okay. Uh, yeah. Sometimes you just got to go track it down. I know some people who don't even use, who like nuke all their, their vertex maps just from the beginning. They'll just erase them all, and then they'll just redo them themselves. So it's just a process. Uh, it's just a process. It really is. It's just a process. Yeah, absolutely. So let's do leg, leg R one more time. And this weight maps thing is something new. And I'm, I'm, I apologize. I wasn't anticipating something new in the interface to pop up. So I might, have to, I might have to be on the associated weight map with that joint. So it's leg R. Go. And so it's real easy. You just grab the, the paint tool itself. Left click and drag. OK. Under commands? Huh? Under commands? Under commands, yep. I'm in the weighting section. Oh, not. <laughs> Excuse me. Let's turn. Uh, there we go. So now, <laughs> that's so silly, but it'll work. There we go. OK. All right, so now if I was to exit setup mode, aha. And that's because I'm on that different weight map. So I'm Let's go back to none, see what happens. But painting vertex maps is really easy with that paint tool. Go back to none. There we go. Oh, I forgot to I also forgot to mention when you're using this normalize, oops, excuse me. When you go into normalize, okay, if normalize weights is on, um, it's going to it's, there's I wasn't really interested in talking about this today, but I'll, I'll introduce the idea, the concept, if you will. Um, each vertice on your polygon can only have a combined value of one. Okay, So you could have three different vertex maps all inf influencing one vertice. Okay? One vertex map could be influencing that vertice by a value of 10%. And the other one can be influencing it by 50%. And the last one would influ influence it by 40%. So the combined influence across all the vertex maps for one vertice is always going to equal one. Okay, um, And I think that is probably what was happening on the deformation of my leg. Okay, Let me go into item mode again and out of setup because this is kind of funky stuff. I bet you anything, if we start looking at, yep, there it is. Here on this other joint, it's influencing those two as well. So I bet you. Yep, that makes sense. That makes sense. Look at this. All of these joints, oops, excuse me, all of these joints along this leg are also influencing to a certain degree vertices on this leg as well. So I need to go through every single joint and ensure that it's not that the vertices on the other side of the leg don't have any sort of weight associated with them. Okay. So it's a combo thing. Because remember, when we rotate this joint here, we're also rotating all of its children as well, which is why that leg is moving. So if we were to go in, let's just take a look at it real fast. Let's go grab the, let's go back into setup mode. And I want to do this from the front just so I make so it's a little bit easier. I'm going to go into my vertex selection set here. Just grab these guys, go look at it from the back. Command shift, grab those guys. And then under adjust weights, we'll just put them down to zero. Double check it. Yep. Awesome. So for that joint, done. Let's grab the next joint down, which is kind of the ankle. There it is. Now in vertex mode, grab all of those guys. Huzzah. Also adjust its weights. To zero. 
Um, I think you can. However, I wouldn't recommend it. Um, I think you'll, you'll get more confused if you do that. But you can. You can select multiple joints. Like I've selected, I can select all my, knee, or all my leg joints, for example. So let's see. Let's see, Seth, if I can influence them globally at the exact same time. Just because I don't do it doesn't mean you can't. Yep, so that was a bad idea. Yeah, so I wouldn't recommend it. I think it's just, it would cause more problems than it solves. There we go, let's grab all of those guys. Whoops, I'm in item mode, sorry. Let's go into vertex mode. And, the, and really the, uh, the, the workflow that I, I would like to encourage you to, to adopt is you select a joint in item mode, and then just pop over into vertex mode. And I haven't been grabbing the base here. There we go. Pop over into vertex mode immediately, and you can make those adjustments. So I'm in item mode, going to grab the toe, and it looks like the toe didn't get anything perfect. Let's just double check. Go. Cool. How about this one? Yeah, so I'd have to do that side too. Let's just see if it worked. Let's go out of setup mode, and we're better. We still got some work we need to do, but that may be from the rotation values of one of these other ones. Yeah, it's probably the root joint that's influencing. So you really kind of have to go in and look at, look at all these pieces and figure out what's going on. Can you say that again? I didn't quite hear you. Um, you know, there's two schools of thought on that. Some people are saying, yeah, it can influence everything. And some people are saying, have it influence nothing. So it's one or the other. One or the other. All right. So that's the process of, of paint weighting. We'll go through, we're going to continue to extend our workflow over the next couple of, uh, uh, the next couple of weeks. You really do have to go through and kind of fine-tune all of this stuff. And let's see. There is a way to mirror all of your vertex maps across the x-axis, and I cannot remember it off the top of my head. So we'll come back, we'll talk about that next week. Yeah. But looking pretty good. It takes, takes, a, it takes some love. It takes a lot of love, actually. But you'll get good. You'll get good at it. It's not so bad. It's just it takes a process to go through, and uh, and select everything and zero out its dependency. I have a question about the of course. Yeah. Uh huh. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So if you need to make a skeletal change, you have to go back to formula to a certain degree. You know, you have to go back to the stage where your skin isn't bound to the skeleton. You got to have your skeleton kind of perfectly dialed before you go any further. Uh, no, yeah, you lose your symmetry. Yeah, you lose your symmetry, which is why you kind of want to make sure that your skeleton is really perfect as you're creating it, because then you gain the ability to make you know symmetrical changes with that symmetry option. Well, you can, yeah, yeah, you can, absolutely, absolutely, and you do that in the in the item list. You do that in the item list. You know, just, you're just reorganizing the hierarchy of, of elements in here. That's all you're doing. And you want to do that before you bind it. Yep. 
Well, yeah, you can. Just go to deformers and delete that normalizing folder, and you're on your way. And that's kind of, in essence, unbinding it. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you gotta find you gotta find where or what bone is influencing that one vertex. In the folder? Yeah, in the in your entire system. Okay. Yeah, you gotta figure out which one is doing it. Which one's pulling it. No, no, you don't want to delete the bone, but you just want to remove its influence on that vertice. Okay. Yep. Let's see if I can find an example here. Yeah, you shouldn't have to delete bones after this job is done. Okay. Yeah, for example, here's a great example. If I was to rotate my thumb, okay, if you look carefully at the, the influence that has been established for my thumb, it's going to move most of my arm, okay? When I rotate my thumb, my forearm shouldn't dance around like that. That's not what we want, okay? So in that particular situation, I gotta figure out, uh, let me just grab all the, go in setup mode, okay? Grab all the vertices, vertices, uh, vertices that I don't wanna be influenced by that joint, which is kind of all of these guys, okay? That can get me started. Go, just weights, put them at zero. Now, when we exit setup mode and rotate that same joint, oops, might help if I'm in item mode. Now, when I rotate that same joint, you know, I missed a couple over here, but my forearm isn't dancing anymore. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like I said, I, I missed a couple. I missed a couple. Yeah, missed all of these guys down here. Like I said, I missed a couple. Yeah, Austin. No, there's no fast way. No, there's no fast way. Nope, there's no fast way. I'm just going to cut you off right there. There is no fast way of doing this. Yeah, um, to delete all the weight maps and to clear them out kind of simultaneously. And that's not a bad idea. Some people like to do that where they just, they have all the weight maps created when you bind it and then they just nuke them. They remove all the, and then they go back in and just, paint them themselves. I've seen people do that in the past, and that's not a bad way of doing it. Um, is there a way to do it all at the same time? Maybe. Because what we're making here is just really nothing more than a whole series of vertex maps that should exist, yeah, that should exist on the green dude. So I just grabbed my green dude, went into my lists, here are all the ver vertex maps that were created when we did the, uh, the skeleton bind, okay? Now, let's just see it. I'm going to Let's, we're going to workshop it. I got all of them selected. If I were to right click on them, there's probably clear. Did that work? No, that did not work. Darn it. I was so looking forward to that working. However, let's try something else. Let's make sure I hit the hit clear. No, that didn't work. Bummer. Um, I don't know if there's a way that you can do it globally across across all the vertex maps at the exact same time. I'm sorry, I can't hear you, Austin. Um, well, if, when you, if you delete them, you know what you're deleting are the actual vertex maps that are that are that are doing the deformation. So you you need all those vertex maps. You need all those vertex maps assigned to each joint to determine which areas of the mesh are going to move when you rotate that joint. Got to have it. Part of the system. Part of the system. I suppose there's I suppose there's nothing in here you couldn't say just grab all the vertexes. Just weights. Zero. You could do it just do it manually. That's a good Good idea. Select more than one and then do the adjust weights. Let's see what happens. Yeah, crash, probably. 
Uh, it did not have the effect that I was hoping it would have. Yeah. No, so you may have to do it manually. Search the forums. They, there might be another, another way to do this. Yeah. Yeah, now with the, the spine, spine one vertex map removed, I could go in and establish which parts of the mesh I want it to influence. And you can do this with the polygonal selection too, which is kind of cool. Okay, so there's spine one. I know I definitely want these rows of polygons in here to be influenced to a degree by the rotation of spine one. And this is, in essence, what you're asking the computer to do when you apply the, excuse me, when you apply the, uh, uh, the smooth binding type or the heat binding type. So now we can do adjust weights, and we'll just put up to 100%. Okay, so if we were to exit setup mode, in item mode, grab spine one and rotate that bad boy. Yeah, we're getting some nice deformation, except up there. I got to figure that part out. Like I said, this is, this is going to make your brain go crazy. Because at times you'll think you'll have it, and then you'll look at your mesh and you go, what? And I'm doing, doing this with a tablet, which is probably not the way I do it. I do it with a regular mouse, so I get that middle mouse button uh, marquee selection. The middle mouse button uh, selection is great because it selects through the entirety of your mesh. Now let's see if it worked. Nope. Say again? How often do I have my joint selected? Yeah, I don't have my joint selected. You're absolutely right, Seth. You're absolutely right. Thank you. Uh, let's go back into setup mode. Actually, let's get out of vertex map. There we go. That's a little bit more indicative. That's that's helping. Ah, I'm in item mode. Now I can more visually see what's happening here. Come on, go back down to zero. Normalize. There it is. Nope. So everything you're doing here, including the face, that is all. This is adjusting either the influence on the mesh and the skeleton together, or the non-influence of that area. Is that what we're all doing? Hold, can you say that again, John? On, on those vertices. You got it. We're kind of basically turning vertices on and off per joint. You got it. Yep. You got it. This is a relationship between the skeletal wall. Yeah. All right. What just happened there? That wasn't supposed to happen. Go 
this way, it's down to zero. There we go. There we go. Let's go to setup mode, and I still have a couple, couple stragglers. A couple stragglers on the back here. Now, it might not be that joint that's causing those in here to move. Uh, remember, when you're working with these, you are working with an entire chain, and there it is, it's spine number two, that's the culprit, okay? Because when we rotate spine number one, we are actually rotating spine number two as well. And spine number two, as you can see, has the vertex map dependencies, or the vertex map, vertex map weight values that are causing all the problems. So now that we, now we know, we know the, the culprit, let's go fix it. Uh, you know, I think there, it's just a workflow thing. It's up, I don't think there's a, a, a better or worse way. Um, I think you just got to do it methodically. Just pick a direction and go in that direction. There it is now. Ah, okay. So let's keep working our way up the chain. So it's spine number three, too. Spine number three has a bunch of it. It's probably a majority of spine three. Yeah, it's those guys. And that's actually my fault. I remember doing that earlier. Go, just weights. Still there. Let's figure out which one it is. Yeah, and actually, this is this is this is my fault because I was messing around with the vertex maps and I wasn't doing it methodically. And I removed the dependency uh, on the top of the spine, or maybe is when I was working with the shoulders. Yeah, nothing is nothing is working with those at the moment. And it's, uh, it's causing some problems. So I, I got some work in front of me to do. At this stage, I would probably just redo my bind and go from there. It'd probably be faster for me to just to kind of uh, rebake everything real fast uh, than sit here and paint all these, all these dependencies back in real fast. Yeah. Yeah, there was, it was pretty indicative earlier. You can see that there's... Yeah, you can see there's holes in here. No, there's no vertice on the, uh, or there's no weight map on my mesh that's influencing the rotation of those polygons in there. And that's because I was going through it as fast as I could, and I just, I, I messed it up. <laughs> so be methodical. Go through this as slowly as you can. You know, click on a joint, see which areas of the mesh are influencing that joint. These joints don't have any influence, okay? Um, and, and go from there, okay? All right, questions on, on this process? Yeah, Cyrus. Um, we're going to talk about that next week. The answer to your question is yes, but we should have done it earlier. Much, much earlier in the stage. Yeah, absolutely. This is just, like I said, this is just baby step one into the rigging world. Next week, we're going to completely redo this rig. I'm going to give you a new character next week, and we're going to, uh, we're going to, do, we're going to increase the, the accuracy and the feature set of our rig, because this is a pretty unusable rig at the moment. Outside of the post tool. Okay. Questions? Questions, questions, questions. So you have Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Well, you know, if you want to change the values on the vertex maps, 
I like using that adjust weights tool because then you can numerically see what's going on. Um, you can also use the paint tool to interactively do it. So, lots of options. Yes. Yeah. In the channels or in the items? Items. Okay, questions. Other questions. Yeah. John. Okay. Yeah. So, and that's and that's going to happen because we really didn't talk and and address how to go in and change the orientation of the center points for all of our joints. So, one of the things that you could do if you have, let me see if I can find a funky one. I want to go into my viewport properties, turn, show weight maps off, and get out of vertex mode and back into advanced OpenGL. Oh, I accidentally deleted some, vert or some polygons, too. Awesome. Great job, Pat. Okay. Um, so let's see if I can find some good ones. Do, 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 do. Probably in my fingers. They're going to be funky and whacked out. Nope, they're all pretty dialed for the most part. So if you have an odd one, and most of the times they seem to get pretty odd right around in the shoulders. For me, I did such a good job. Mine are all perfect. But if, you're, if you have some on yours that are just really weird, the knees can get funky at times. No, I just did mine just perfectly. Darn it. Um, here's what you can do. You can change your action centers or the orientations of those joints temporarily if you want to just test them. Okay? So you can change the orientation to like the, the world position. Fire off the move tool. Okay, hit the world button and it will automatically uh, move your action handles to be aligned with the world orientation of your X, Y, and Z axis. Okay, or you can go local and now it's taking the orientation of the center point, it's kind of overdriving it, if you will. Yep. Yeah, that's the local orientation. So that's an that's a, that's a easy, easy way to just kind of change the location of your tool handles. Although uh, this kind of adds a couple issues down the line. Um, ideally, we want to have this, ideally we need to change the orientation of the joints to follow a very specific series of rules um, to get the proper rotation of the joints when we start moving them. Okay, like for example, we, we want all of, all of our leg joints in here to be firing down the z-axis. We, we want the orientation of the x-axis to be in a very specific way so we can rotate the legs correctly. And when we start applying the, the IK handles, their orientation will be correct when the IK handle starts driving this. That'll come next week. Come next week. Yes. The art of rigging is incredibly complex, so I'm, I'm only going to give it to you in small chunks. Okay. Because if I gave it to you all in one mighty fail swoop, we'd be here until like 10 o'clock tonight, and you guys wouldn't remember anything. All right, questions, questions, questions. Other questions? All right, we got about 45 minutes left in class. Let's use the remaining time to continue to work on our character. If you've been following along, you might be able to bang out this character before you go home tonight and or please complete the render and animation for your uh, alien invasion that is due today, okay? So please make sure that gets done. All right.